Hello, my name is Mae Davenport, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Forest Resources and the director of the Center for Changing Landscapes here at the University of Minnesota. I'm really excited to talk with you today about uh, the social sciences and how they relate to water resources and water resource management. So I'm in the Department of Forest Resources, but I'm not a forester. I'm a social scientist, and my research and teaching really focuses on humans and human communities and how they relate to natural resources and the environment. Today I'm going to focus on water and water resources and how it relates to society um, and to people as individual actors within the water system. So I want to start by uh, describing some major premises that, that really support my work and thinking around the human dimensions of water resources. Um, and these premises, I guess you could say, are sort of assumptions that uh, serve as a grounding for the work that we do in studying these issues. Um, in 2013, the U.S. Global Change Research Program uh, developed a series of strategies for addressing global change. Um, and the, the report describes an, uh, the need for social science uh, and the, the human understanding of of impacts to water resources. And so fundamentally, um, I think we can all agree that humans are the drivers of, of water problems. Uh, humans are responsible for impacts to water quality, for changes related to uh, water quantity like flooding and droughts. Um, and so humans are at the center of the water system. Uh, moreover, as we know and experience, humans are affected by water problems. Um, they experience the consequences of land use decisions, of uh, failure to conserve or protect water resources. Um, and for many, this is a day-to-day -day struggle. But on a brighter note, um, humans and human communities have the capacity to respond to water resource threats posed by global change. So we believe that humans um, and the communities they live in have the potential to um, transform themselves and uh, adapt to impacts to really make a difference and to protect and restore water resources. Um, so this is sort of the major premise of the talk today and also I think provi provides a sound grounding and justification for the need for the social sciences in water resource management. So this is a busy slide, um, but there's a lot to it, and I want to kind of walk you through uh, what I see as, as a good framework for thinking about the human dimensions of conservation and natural resource management, and, and in particular, the human dimensions of water resources. So the social sciences is kind of a, a fuzzy term, but it's really an umbrella concept uh, that uh, brings together many disciplines. And they're not all listed here, but the dis disciplines that I work most closely with are psychology and social psychology, sociology, political science, anthropology, economics, and geography. And so within these disciplines, there are sub-disciplines and also fields um, like environmental psychology, environmental sociology, or political ecology. And so the marriage of different disciplines and their focus on natural resources and the environment have developed these, these uh, sub-disciplines or fields. And so the human dimensions of conservation and natural resource management is really sort of the, um, the connection between these different fields. And so social, social scientists like me who um, studied sociology and psychology and social psychology, but are really interested in applying theories and concepts in those disciplines to the practical problems related to conservation and natural resource management and water, we refer to ourselves as, hum as uh, you know, human dimensions researchers in conservation and natural resource management. So this is just kind of a maybe a taxonomy to uh, understand social sciences and how uh, there's a diversity in worldviews and philosophies uh, that uh, make this field so rich and interesting um, and interdisciplinary within itself. So folks that attack the problem or respond to the problem 
of water resources and societal impacts from very different perspectives. So one of the first questions I want to pose to you is how do humans and human communities relate to water? And of course you can think day to day how you relate to water when you wake up in the morning and brush your teeth, um, uh, when you use the toilet, when you wash your clothes, um, you have a day-to-day -day connection to water. Um, I think there's something like 40 gallons of water uh, in every glass of beer, for example. So if you tend to drink beer or you drink beverages, um, uh, water is part of the process of making those beverages, not only the water that you drink directly, but the water that was used to process and, and uh, create food and create beverages. And so humans relate to water in many ways. Um, but what I want to talk about is, is kind of an overarching concept of the use and non-use benefits of water. And I think most fundamentally we think about how we depend on water for our very survival. Um, so the sustenance values of water or benefits of water through consumption, as I described, through irrigation of crops, um, watering of livestock, through transportation and energy, um, waste disposal, and then also you might think of tourism uh, and the economic uh, uh, potential, the economic benefits of tourism, um, which is a major industry in Minnesota, uh, about an $11 billion industry in Minnesota alone, um, related to outdoor recreation and tourism. So those are maybe the top of mind benefits of, of water for many of us. But in some cases, it's all, there are also benefits that uh, we take for granted. Here's just a quick uh, pie chart that I think demonstrates use of water in Minnesota. This is from 2005, so it's a little bit dated. Um, but you can see here all the various uses from aquaculture to uh, public supplies of water for drinking water and, and uh, domestic uses to industrial and mining. By the way, the category that's missing there, the pink category, which is 60.5%, um, is the biggest, clearly the biggest use of water. Does anyone have a guess as to what that might be? It's thermoelectric power. So across the U.S., thermoelectric power uh, is, is the uh, use of water, uh, the consumption of water at, at the biggest amount in, in water systems. So it's interesting to think about how you as an individual uses water, but also how your communities, and in this case your state uses water, and what those uses are for. As a social scientist, I'm really interested in how people identify with water and how entire communities uh, depend on water for quality of life and their cultural uh, practices and cultural experiences. So the metaphysical and spiritual connections that we have with water. You might think of the Ojibwe and their spiritual connections to Minoman or wild rice. Um, cultural connections to water through recreation, fishing, uh, hunting, um, motorboating, swimming. Uh, people in Minnesota, especially you think of the, ten, the land of 10,000 lakes, uh, the recreation opportunities are abundant and water is at the center of many of those recreational opportunities. Canoeing, boating, uh, fishing, and kayaking, to name just a few. So there are also clear benefits to your psychological and social well-being related to water. Um, water recreation and uh, water spiritual connections can increase your uh, self-confidence can increase your belief in yourself as someone who um, has meaning in your life or the, the recreational fitness uh, relation to water if you're a swimmer for example. Um, water can be a place that brings communities together to celebrate and that has uh, a very important benefits socially to communities um, in terms of celebrating and, and community cohesion and community pride. So water, coming to the water as a community uh, can be an important overall benefit 
to uh, individuals and, and to communities at large. Then you have uh, ecological protection, the benefits of water related to um, protecting ecosystems. Uh, ecosystem, not just structure, but the function of ecosystems. If you think of the services that water resources, wetlands and streams provide in regulating flooding, regulating water flow, for example. Um, and of course, the, the critters and the plants that live in the water, plants, fish, and wildlife. Um, so people connect with water in many ways from uh, depending on water for basic needs, basic uh, survival, to developing a sense of quality of life, a sense of personal identity, uh, to depending on ecosystem services like water, uh, like cleaning water through wetlands uh, filtration or regulating flooding. Uh, and then also, of course, the, the plants and the fish and the wildlife that depend on, on water resources and healthy ecosystems. So the other way in which humans relate to water is in times of crisis. Um, droughts, floods, and pollution stress human populations and result in a crisis moment. It might be at an individual level, it might be at a community level, societal level, or global level. Uh, droughts, for example, in Minnesota, the implication is often wildfire. Um, and so that hits home for a lot of folks who are uh, living in forested areas or concerned about the impacts to wilderness up in northeastern Minnesota, for example. Um, water crisis in the, in the way of drought really hits home uh, when there are certain policies that are enacted that might restrict your use of water in your household. For example, in some cases, Communities will uh, require uh, limits on water or ban watering your lawn, for example, in times of water scarcity. On the other side of the spectrum is floods, so issues related to uh, too much water in 2012 where there was uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of infrastructure damage to the Duluth area. Um, another example might be in terms of loss of life, uh, where uh, we have drownings and other, re other impacts associated with flooding, where uh, humans really encounter a crisis moment, uh, families and communities that lose members um, are really challenged and, and really prompted to act and change the way uh, that they think about water and maybe manage water. Here in the Twin Cities we have issues with basement flooding. Uh, that can be another example of the way in which people uh, experience water and relate to water that hits home. I also want to talk about pollution and the impacts of pollution on uh, water resources on humans and how there are many crisis events associated with impairments to streams, to lakes, and uh, to oceans. In the example of Gulf hypoxia, uh, we have the issue of nutrient management and nutrient loadings like phosphorus and nitrogen that are uh, impacting water through the Mississippi uh, watershed, all the way from, from Canada and Minnesota into uh, the Gulf of, Hi Gulf of Mexico. We have concerns around uh, fertilizer use and high nutrient loadings and the impacts to the ecosystem in the Gulf of Mexico. We have basically areas of the Gulf which are anoxic and cannot support life. Um, fish kills, we've had examples of fish kills in Minnesota, certainly concerns around contaminated drinking water, and then beach closures. Uh, we've had beach clo closures on Lake Superior and other places in the Twin Cities area when there are specific concerns around bacteria like E. coli uh, that can cause intestinal issues and, and other kinds of uh, skin infections. So there are all sorts of examples, I think, of this crisis moment uh, in terms of water resource management and the way in which people relate and depend on healthy water.
A recent publication, April 2015, from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency uh, asked the question, are our waters swimmable, fishable, and fixable? Uh, the report suggests that waters in southwest Minnesota are not swimmable or fishable. And uh, really challenging land, landowners and uh, other local officials at county levels, at municipal levels, to rethink the way we manage water and manage land uses. Um, and this report has, has drawn a lot of attention to the issue of, of pollutants, um, especially related to erosion and nutrients, as I mentioned, like phosphorus and nitrates, and also E. coli, and concerns about how the land of 10,000 lakes um, has a number of lakes that are impaired. Um, some estimates are up to 30, 40 percent of water resources that have been assessed uh, are impaired in Minnesota. So we've talked a little bit about how humans and human communities relate to water through those benefits and services that water provides and also in those crisis moments when water is scarce or when water is impaired and polluted. I'd like to uh, shift a little bit and think about how humans interact with water and primarily I want to focus on conservation management approaches to water. So in many ways you can think of a landowner or a resident who consumes water, who makes decisions about the way their household operates, the way they may um, drain rainwater from their property, for example, or um, the way they use water on a day-to-day -day basis and how those uses, household and land uses, affect water. Um, but we also impact water from a societal standpoint. If you think of land use policies, um, policies about growth and development, permitting that is associated with, with industry and other polluters, um, that is all based on this sort of conservation approach to water. How do we protect water? How do we restore water in the long term? So individuals are actors, but entire communities are also actors in the water system. Traditionally, we've taken kind of a problem-centered or reactionary approach to water management. Um, as I mentioned, we benefit, clearly benefit. Uh, we survive, and, and our survival depends on water. Um, so when there's a problem with water, either in the quality of water or quantity, too much, too little, um, we want to address those problems. We need to. So in many ways, this is sort of a reactionary um, uh, response, solving problems. And these, these approaches are really user-driven because it takes the user of water, the consumer of water, to identify that problem. The challenges of a problem-centered approach is that it's very piecemeal and it doesn't really address uh, the core problems of water in terms of how we use land and how we uh, consume water. So the next approach is really what has been referred to as an expert-driven or scientist-driven approach where we start to break down the hydraulics, the hydrology of water systems uh, and understand uh, at a systematic level uh, what is causing problems. What are the sources? What are the, the transport or delivery systems? And what are the ecological impacts and the biophysical impacts of water? This is very science-centered. In many cases, it's very disciplinary. Um, and it provides, however, a very strong support for thinking about water systems and uh, the relationship, the biochemical relationships of water, the, the physical uh, attributes of water, streams and lakes, and has, has provided some scientific grounding to this problem-centered approach. The third approach, uh, I think we experience uh, more readily uh, today, and that is the program-centered approach. And, just chatting with some water resource managers the other day and they called this the flavor of the month approach to water management 
where water programs are really politically driven and uh, they're very um, uh, subject uh, to the, the um, political drivers of, of decision making. And so um, we have different programs, conservation reserve programs, uh, a, lot, a lot of programs that are designed to sort of address problems maybe from an agricultural perspective or maybe from um, an industrial perspective around uh, uh, thermoelectric use of water. Or maybe it's an energy perspective where we're thinking about water use in uh, the production of of fuels, and so this flavor of the month is really kind of, approach is really kind of politically driven, and it's top down, and it has to do with funding and policies and the farm bill and legislation that really uh, uh, is influenced by a lot of special interests and um, certainly can be very um, partisanal in terms of uh, who's in office and uh, what the initiative is of uh, folks who are in charge. The fourth approach um, is, is gaining a lot of momentum and there are a lot of folks who have talked about a systems thinking approach um, or a systems approach to water resources that acknowledges the relationship between people and water and so rather than just engineers and scientists and uh, public officials coming together to make policy around water, we're recognizing that landowners and residents and community members need to be in on those conversations. I call this social hydrologic system centered, um, but essentially it is that connection between uh, ecosystems and water systems and human and social systems. So thinking across those systems and understanding the causes and consequences and the interactions of people and how people relate to water. Um, and this is also grounded in science um, and, and it, it's interdisciplinary. So we have social scientists working with hydrologists um, and aquatic ecologists and biologists who understand problems, their sources, and then to develop solutions that are not only science-based, but community-based. Um, so we know not just what's happening in water systems, but how we address those problems um, and how people can come together to, to make a difference in water resource management. So now I'm going to present to you a couple of theoretical models related to conservation social sciences. And they're models that have been developed uh, uh, over the last several years in conversations I've had with water resource managers, but they're also solidly grounded in existing theories from social sciences, uh, from psychology, social, uh, social psychology, um, and fields like community psychology. I think an effective analogy for understanding the social sciences of behavior is the tip of the iceberg here. So we have behaviors as being sort of the presenting issue. Um, perhaps we want people to conserve water or uh, uh, use a rain barrel or plant a um, rain garden in their backyards. Um, we're really, we can really focus in on behaviors because behaviors are easily seen um, they can be measured. You can see if people are performing a, a particular behavior. Uh, but behavior is only really what's the presenting issue. And we need to understand people and what makes people tick. We need to think a little bit deeper. And so there are all sorts of, as I said, psychological and social psychological theories around what drives behavior. Um, certainly people talk about attitudes towards behavior as being a driver. If you think of um, the behavior being exercise, your attitudes towards exercise uh, are highly influential in your decision to exercise. And so if, if you have a certain attitude towards the outcome of exercise, maybe it's a social thing for you, maybe it's a physical health or mental health outcome that you're looking for, 
if you like those outcomes and you think that exercise will get you there, um, then you'll have a positive attitude towards that behavior. But there are all sorts of other factors that you have to consider, and that is your own perception of your ability to perform the behavior. Am I able to exercise? Do I have the resources? Is a gym accessible or a pool? Um, is it a rainy day and I can't go out running? So those, your perceptions of your own ability to exercise, to behave in a certain way, is also a factor or a determinant of your behavior. Self-identity, sense of personal responsibility to act. Um, if you identify as a runner, you're more likely to uh, run. If you hang out with others who see you as a runner, um, you're more likely to be a runner and, and um, to go out and go jogging regularly. Same thing goes with conservation behavior. If you see yourself as someone who is, is conservation-minded, um, who is going to go the extra mile to recycle a, a bottle of pop or to um, uh, take care of your, your yard and pick up your leaves after um, in the fall to avoid uh, your leaves getting into the, the storm sewers, um, you're the type of person who feels that sense of responsibility to act. But of course, behavior is also driven by knowledge and understanding, understanding and an awareness of problems and their solutions. Um, so if you have the sense that exercise is the solution to higher blood pressure or obesity, and you understand the relationship between those uh, causes and consequences of, of um, health problems, then you're more likely to, to exercise. Um, same thing goes with conservation. If you understand the relationship between precipitation or storm events and your rain gutters and how the water from your roof, um, if you're a homeowner or renter, and, and um, that water can get into the system and the water brings with it whatever pollutants are on the ground um, and goes to the nearest stream. So if you understand the, the connection between land uses, um, your backyard and water, you're more likely to behave in a way that protects those systems. What others do and think should be done is a major driver. Peer pressure, thinking about those social norms and how uh, we are motivated to perhaps uh, be like our neighbors or our friends or our family members, um, that we care what they think of us. Um, that is a major driver of behavior. And then basic beliefs, uh, your basic beliefs about the relationship between people and water or people and nature, uh, how we use nature, how we take care of it, um, those are sort of the fundamental drivers of, of conservation behavior. So the model I want to share with you today um, is a moral obligation model of conservation behavior. And it really starts with, with um, that bottom of the iceberg, the values. Your basic value orientations, environmental values, and cultural values shape uh, how you think about these issues. They shape your day-to-day -day action. Now, values are very uh, uh, few in number, and they're very durable or difficult to change. Um, they're sort of uh, the, the principles by which you live your life. Um, they're developed in you as a young person and continue to develop, uh, but they're kind of the anchor that, that helps you make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the next uh, set of drivers of behavior um, are those social norms. So peer pressured thinking. Um, others are doing it, others are acting in a, in a certain way, and so um, I'm going to do it. It's an external driver. Uh, how you take care of your, your, how you take care of water, how you take care of your backyard or your property, or if you're a farmer, how you take care of your farm, um, that can all be influenced by others around you. What others do and what you, what you think others uh, think you should do can influence your, your behavior. Moral thinking. Um, this model is really grounded in the idea that conservation action is a moral behavior and um, that we act in a way to help our community members or to help the environment not because of 
personal benefits that we gain, but because we think it's the right thing to do, <clears throat> that we feel a moral or ethical responsibility to act. And so, um, you know, that moral, those moral drivers um, depend on many things. They depend on an awareness of consequences of your actions to others, a concern for those consequences, um, and then the sense of personal responsibility uh, to get things done, to, to address those problems. That's moral thinking. Now the last driver of behavior is that is rational thinking and essentially it's sort of your self-interest or your self-motivations um, uh, to act because you're weighing the costs and benefits of a behavior. This is where the attitudes come into play, your belief toward an outcome like exercise and then your evaluation of that outcome, your perceived ability to perform, and then your perceived sort of um, sense of efficacy. If I adopt this conservation practice, will it really make a difference, say, in uh, affecting gulf hypoxia in reducing those impacts? Um, and so that self-efficacy and self-determination is really important as well. So this model you can see is, is pretty complex, but it really brings together th three different areas of thinking that are certainly not mut mutually exclusive. You're constantly, when you're making decisions day to day about your actions, whether they're helping other people, helping yourself, thinking about the environment, you're constantly being um, influenced by peer pressure, by your moral grounding, your ethical grounding, and also by your self-interest, weighing the costs and benefits. How will this affect me? Um, this model is very useful in thinking about water resource management and say if we wanted to do a study of farmers and think about conservation behavior and why a farmer might adopt a conservation behavior um, or choose not to, we can follow this model um, and ask questions uh, in a survey, for example, of a farmer that relate to each of these areas. And develop a, a model helps us predict behavior, a model helps us understand behavior, and um, a model is important in helping us influence behavior with programs like outreach, education, um, and uh, collaborative decision-making kinds of programs. So while the model may seem very theoretical, it has a lot of practical implications for water resource management. So we're back to the iceberg, and um, I kind of want to use that model of behavior, the moral obligation model of behavior, as a stepping stone for this next discussion, which has to do with bringing the focus not just on the individual, but on the community. And so in many ways, if we think about the way society relates to water, it's at the community scale. So again, the presenting um, condition is community member conservation behavior. We can see people act, um, how their actions affect uh, the water system. We can observe that. But what's more difficult to observe are the other components of a community. Um, and they're just as important because the community affects the individual. So individual capacity to act is something we might consider. Um, but also you have relationships between people. So as we said in the moral obligation model, you're impacted not just by your own rational interest, but you're, in you're impacted by what, how you see others uh, act and how those others might influence you. So those relationships within a community, how people influence one another, how information about water or about community issues uh, are exchanged, how people might influence um, the way you think about uh, water is very important. Next we have uh, organizational capacity. So in a community framework, uh, we might think about how individuals affect water and how relationships might affect people. Uh, but then we have a more formalized relationship, which is that organization. It could be your local government. It could be a service organization within your community. Uh, the um, many youth programs, many organizations that, that help 
people think about their civic responsibilities. Um, you have uh, uh, tourism bureaus and, and departments of commerce and other organizations that influence how a community acts in its relationship with water. I think first and foremost we might think of the government unit, whether it's a township or a municipality or a county or a state, and the agencies that are involved in land use decisions or economic decisions as being organizations. But there are many community-based organizations, nonprofits, uh, faith-based organizations that can influence the way an individual makes decisions and the effect an individual might have on natural resources and water. We have programmatic capacity. Uh, programs are the things that affect us day to day as a community member. Um, you might think of, of uh, law enforcement programs, for example, but there are also education programs, uh, programs that provide technical assistance or financial assistance to you if you're making decisions about uh, conservation, uh, recycling programs is an example. Farmers can get involved in uh, lots of uh, cost share programs to help them adopt conservation practices or perhaps payment programs in which they retire land uh, uh, out of production so they can protect maybe a wetland or a stream, uh, stream bank area. So there are all sorts of programs both related to water and to community that provide an opportunity for us to think about how an individual and how a community might act in the water system. Now the next two boxes I'm going to bring up um, are, are really important, though they're very difficult to measure as a social scientist, um, but they're, uh, they're concepts that are critical to uh, an individual's sense of community or a community's overall impact on natural resources and on water. Perceived trust in one another. If you trust your uh, local official, your government representative, if you trust your neighbor, if you trust the people that you work with, um, that trust relationship between others can really influence you. It can influence your beliefs about people and your beliefs about the natural resources. Um, your trust in scientists, for example, can influence your beliefs about these water impacts that we're hearing about, trust in the media. Um, those are all sort of situations or conditions that can affect your, uh, your behavior and your beliefs, uh, your belief systems. Legitimacy has to do with your understanding of an organization uh, being a legitimate authority and making decisions about your community or about water. And then of course fairness has to do with, uh, with your understanding or belief about uh, the impacts of different kinds of programs or decisions that are made and how they impact you. Community identity and culture uh, it has emerged as a very important factor in thinking about the human dimensions of water. Um, I mentioned the cultural connections to water in terms of uh, water as providing recreation, water is providing uh, spiritual connections. Um, in, in many communities, water is sacred or water provides the opportunities for communing with, with spirits or with um, your faith. And, and so that community identity and culture around water is really important to understand. Now, if we take a step back and think about the disciplines, the multidisciplinary nature, of, of the social sciences and the human dimensions of water resources, we can start to see how different disciplines can provide insight uh, in terms of research and understanding and discovery around these areas. A psychologist might focus on individual capacity, while a sociologist might be really interested in relationships and how people are influenced in different dynamics, uh, community dynamics or conflict, for example, around water. Organizational capacity, political scientists might study organizational capacity um, or programmatic capacity. And, and there's a lot of interest in understanding issues of trust, legitimacy, fairness, and community identity across all of those disciplines. So there are great opportunities for 
both disciplinary and interdisciplinary work in the social sciences to better understand community capacity to protect water um, and also to understand how water can be uh, um, a gathering place to build capacity within communities at individual level at, uh, in terms of social networks and relationships and then in governance as well. So this slide is, is essentially um, uh, the model that I've developed that looks at the multi-level community capacity uh, in sustainable watershed management. So it's taking the concepts that we discussed in the iceberg and applying them in a, a more, um, uh, uh, applying them in a way that is, is, shows you the focus of different kinds of programs. And I think this is important because Historically, in water resource protection, we've really been keying in on the individual providing education, uh, offering uh, technical assistance to landowners or to residents um, who are interested in learning how to change their behavior to protect water. Uh, regulations are a very individual-based kind of program. What, what I argue for and others have argued for is more of a community-based approach to water programming. A uh, community-based approach acknowledges the vast resources that a community brings to water resource problems of flooding and, and pollution and drought. Um, and it's not just up to the individual to change behavior, but it's about community-level transformation. And so by sort of ex expanding the lens by um, uh, 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 instead of zooming in, but you're um, spanning out and thinking about programs, organizations, relationships, and individuals, uh, water resource managers can better connect uh, the, uh, better connect water issues with what's important to the community. In my work with water resource managers in Minnesota and in the metro area, we talk about bringing water to the community uh, bringing water problems and water, water issues and the dialogue around water to the community, community versus expecting individuals to come to water programs or to come to and think about water. And so it's really kind of a transformation about adapting programs and policies and planning to fit your community. And each community has different capacities across these levels. Some communities may have very high relational capacity and individual capacity, but low organizational and programmatic capacity. Many rural communities experience that. In other communities, many metro communities or urban communities, I should say, have high programmatic capacity, high organizational capacity, but people don't know one another. Um, and individuals may not have a strong connection to water, to natural resources. So there are all sorts of ways in which we can build capacity in these areas um, to produce an environment and a community, develop a, a community uh, that is more likely to sustainably manage water resources. So just revisiting those major premises, which I think are so important, um, and this is kind of my um, uh, uh, speech about the value of social sciences in water resources. Um, we, we do have really strong biophysical understanding of water problems. Um, we have engineering solutions that are sound, that are, uh, have proven to be effective um, in, in research and in application. Um, but the core issue of water resources um, are people. And if we don't understand people and how uh, they, how their decision making and how their actions affect water. Um, and if we don't understand how water problems affect people um, in different ways, um, then we're, we have um, not, we're missing, we are missing a major piece in the puzzle of, of resolving problems related to water. Equally important, I think, is the idea that humans and human communities uh, have maybe have gotten us into this mess, but we have the, the great capacity uh, to organize, the great capacity to sort of redefine ourselves and make commitments to 
um, understanding problems and the monitoring um, problems over time and really addressing problems at the core. And we have many examples of success stories across Minnesota and across the United States where people committed themselves to changing behavior um, or to collectively coming together as a community and changing the way they use land and use water uh, to protect water um, and to protect community.